Hello, and welcome to the Sonic Cinema Podcast. My name is Brian Scuttle, and thank you for joining us at www.sonic-cinema.com. Uh, this week, we're going to do another filmmaker interview, but it's going to be a bit different. Uh, I'm going to be talking again to Chris Esper, who I talked to in November about uh, his book, The Filmmaker's Journey, as well as his uh, career up until that point. But today we're going to be talking about a different filmmaker. We're going to be talking about the works of Martin Scorsese, in particular the uh, his trilogy of faith in The Last Temptation of Christ, Kundun, and Silence. And I hope you enjoy the conversation we had. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for joining us for the uh, Sonic Cinema podcast, and it's my uh, pleasure to uh, welcome back a filmmaker from Massachusetts, um, who I talked to back in uh, November of 2016 uh, about his about his book, The Filmmaker's Journey, and uh, who's actually uh, given me a couple of films to uh, watch and really enjoy earlier this year, The Deja Vuers and uh, Undatement Center. And uh, please welcome back to the uh, podcast, uh, writer-director Chris Esper. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me again, Brian. This is great. So what I want to talk about uh, today and one of the things that uh, we we sort of talked about um, doing after our first podcast, it was some it was an idea that I had before that first podcast was I wanted to talk to you knowing how big of a Scorsese fan you are on yep. um, because of the fact that Martin Scorsese's silence came out earlier this year, I wanted to uh, just basically have a nice back and forth with you on uh, his his trilogy of faith, uh, Last Temptation of Christ, Kundun, and yeah. uh, Silence, and just sort of comparing and contrasting the movies and uh, how they, how they, uh, how they have, how they're similar in a lot of ways, but also how they're very different, um, right. in terms of what they say about faith and what they say about the, uh, people with the subject at the, uh, outset. Right. And I know, I know I, uh, I actually, before silence came out, I was able to watch, uh, Last Temptation of Christ and Kundun again and then go rain to silence basically like the next day so it was really interesting for me to watch all three sort of back to back to back and i was really able to pinpoint a lot of uh similarities and especially some similarities between last temptation of christ and kundun i'd never really thought about before because last temptation of christ is obviously based on the book by uh kazistanis um and was highly controversial, whereas Kundun was basically a, a biopic was written by Melissa Matheson, who had done E.T. for Spielberg, and follows yep. a lot of the similar, a lot of the same uh, biopic uh, traps that we tend to see in a lot of movies. But one of the things yeah. watching them back to back is it was easier for me to see sort of... Com- common ground in both films I'd never really experienced before in watching them. No, I, I agree. I mean, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the Kundun was a hard one for me to uh, track down, to actually watch, but haven't seen the behind-the-scenes documentary as well as uh, looking at the trailer and a couple of scenes from the film. It's pretty evident how, I agree, how similar... It is to Last Temptation. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, and Dune seems to take on a more positive vibe. I, it's Scorsese himself, as you described, that Dune was a more positive picture to take on, uh, whereas Last Temptation uh, didn't have that same sort of positivity. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that to to a large degree. And I mean, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that uh, the Dalai Lama obviously uh, had had some input as far as how his story was going to be presented. And right. I and just based on the fact that Melissa Matheson is a writer who's best known as e, for E.T., which is 
sure. very much a family movie. And, I mean, I think sure. I think to a certain extent, uh, that's the. It's a very different based on those two things alone, and based on again, sort of like you were saying, I do think it does have a positive tone, and I think that also has to do with the the main character of the Dalai Lama himself, and that he's a very different. His story is a very different story than uh, Jesus in Last Temptation. Uh, yes. Last Temptation is much more about um, Jesus struggling with his yeah. with with his calling. I mean, to a certain extent, I do think uh, Kundun follows in the same way, but it's not quite as intense in that way. Yeah, and uh, that is one of the one of the things I hadn't felt was very much in common with those two movies is that they're both about, obviously they're both about important figures in their respective religions, but also they're also, they're also about um, people who are leaders in their religions who are struggling to find the best way in which to practice and to uh, teach their teach the messages of their religion. And yes. Jesus in Last Temptation is very much, it's a process all the way through to the very end when right. he when he finally realizes uh, that the uh, that the life that the the guardian quote unquote guardian angel was given him is in fact just a hallucination by Satan in his weakest moment. And yes. that's something that uh and so that and that struggle, and uh, because of the fact that the Dalai Lama is a political figure as well as a spiritual figure, that dynamic trying to figure out how to lead his people in this moment of crisis when China is starting to take over is very much in common with what Jesus in Last Temptation is dealing with. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's fascinating how. With silence, he's kind of combining both of those elements of the the Japanese culture, like we see in Kadun, and then the more um, Christianity uh, side of things, like in Last Temptation. So it's really neat to see those two things that came together when Silence came out. Which, again, both uh, like both those films, Silence clearly. Uh, it follows that same sort of thread, and it's funny because he's often said how going to the cinema is the equivalent of attending mass, and it's re that's so evident in all three films. Mm -hmm. No, I I definitely agree, and to bring in, I absolutely agree with what you said as far as silence because of the fact that it does it it follows very much in the same vein of Kundun and Last Temptation. Where yep. Yep. Uh, Rodriguez, the Andrew Garfield character, is very much struggling with how to how to practice and how to uh, how to espouse his faith to the people of Japan in a place that is very hostile towards what he is offering. And yep. one of the and it's and it's interesting that you you see him his struggle. And then you see sort of where he's going to end up in when we first see Father Ferreira, the Liam Neeson character, come in at the very end. And we see just in that one moment, sort of based on what we saw of Ferreira in the beginning, just see a, an entire character arc in two scenes. And that's a character yeah. arc that we've experienced throughout with uh, Rodriguez. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that moment with uh, Liam Nielsen, that moment hit me like a ton of bricks because mm -hmm. it was just such a... Uh, it was such a profound moment that, for me as a Catholic man, it raised a lot of questions. Oh, film did, but that scene alone where... Everything changes for Andrew Garfield's character, and your his pain, his plight, you totally fall for it in that moment. It's such mm -hmm. a uh, yeah, yeah, 
And it's funny, it's like myself who I, you know, I've got some religion in my background, but I'm not specifically religious right now. And I never sure. haven't really have been. I actually went to go yeah, see I, silence. Yeah. I actually went to go see silence with a friend of mine who's very religious and who, who was very interested in seeing the movie too. And we went to go see it opening night and it was yeah. very fascinating to talk to him and sort of see where he was coming from and how the story relate how he saw the story compared to how I saw the story. I mean, one of the but, one of the ways that's one of the ways that our viewpoints sort of differed is just the the plight of the missionaries and just sort of what they the resistance that they encountered in Japan and sort of what is what are we supposed to take away? And one of the interesting things is we both obviously took away very different things. It's like he he saw the he saw Christianity being persecuted and there that's very much going on, but one of the thing but the thing that I think resonated with me strongest is the fact is this realization that Ferreira had that and uh, Rodriguez ends up having, which is the fact that it's trying to reconcile their faith and realize that 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 faith is their faith needs and the way they practice it is going to have to change based on the yep. place that they are, place they're at, as opposed to the place they're at changing because of their faith. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. obviously it was very interesting to have that discussion. And it was a great discussion on the way home when we were talking about that, that uh, just that, that difference. And uh, you know, the fact that we were able to respectfully have that type of discussion. Yeah, no, I, and I, I think, I think that's, I mean, that obviously I think that's when you know that uh, you have a great film and, and that uh, you're able to have those viewpoints and talk about afterwards. The film that after, after it was over, it, it lingered in my head for the days to come uh, because there was just so much there uh, to think about and talk about. Uh, it's a shame, really, that uh, it didn't get more recognized both by the Academy and by the uh, film critics when it, when it was released because mm -hmm. I think that... Uh, I think it's truly an, an important movie. Yeah. No, and I mean, I, I definitely, you know, and it was it was interesting. It's like, obviously, the audiences didn't really, because we only, the theater I work at, we only had the movie for a couple weeks. And right. uh, so it, it, like, came and went from theaters around here. Yeah. And it was, it's disappointing, but it's like, I, I look back on Box Office Mojo to see, like, what the box office was compared to Kundun and Last Temptation, it's basically even. But it's really? still, like, it's really... Well, it's, it's still very much under... None of them have made more than, like, $8 million or something like that, as far yeah. as, like, at the time that they were released. But the fact that better is, like, the overall was basically even between the three. I mean, it's not necessarily saying Silence did well. It just... It's, it's more disheartening, the fact the idea that these three terrific films, three really profound films just haven't been able, weren't really able to get a foothold. Right. And, and, uh, and I, and I think part of that is because it's such a departure for Scorsese as a filmmaker, because most know him for his very fast paced mm -hmm. editing style and, and very, uh, in your face, uh, violence. And here he, He's he's real here with these three films. He's taking a step back, and he's you know, and he's letting the he's letting all the the beautiful scenery take place. He's letting the characters speak uh, for themselves, and it's more they're more character they're more dialogue driven pieces than anything else, which I think is is wonderful. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I would definitely agree with that, and yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're just used to Goodfellas, you're just used to Departed or Raging Bull or Wolf of Wall Street and stuff right. like that. It's like obviously, it's a very big departure for Scorsese, but at the same time, it, you you kind of feel like this is the type of 
if like these are the types of movies that I think Scorsese would almost to a certain extent prefer to be known for I mean I not that not yeah. that he's not obviously proud of the other great films that he's made because obviously should be but yeah just just the fact that this I think is him sort of getting in, getting back in touch with his his very much in touch with his spiritual side very much in touch with the side that he wanted to when he wanted to be a priest when he was growing up that's right before he yeah. went to being a filmmaker that's and right. uh it's it's just it's one of the more fascinating things about all three of these is how how different they are and yet how similar each of the each of them end up being to one another and you really right. and you really feel that through line uh when when you're able to watch all three of them so absolutely absolutely yeah and i mean it's clearly evident with those but also too um uh there's a lot he has a lot of those uh in both good and good fellows very good both especially uh kind of a taxi driver there's a lot of that underlining religious element to it mm -hmm. very very subtle uh, especially in the way he shoots his films for example in taxi driver he makes a lot of use of overhead shots yeah. um and I, what I interpret from it, and I believe he even confirmed this as well, is that he called it God's point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 in other words, that uh, he is in a way, the, trip, the character of Travis Pickle is, is almost like God's angel, the one that's going to be cleaning up the mess on the street. Like, it's his mission to do that. His mission in life is to do this uh, for another purpose other than just for his own pleasure. And so... I tri and I hope oh, Mitri is also I mean, the opening monologue, uh, which is actually performed by himself. Uh, quite frank, uh, the opening uh, voiceover narration that Scorsese himself, you know, talking about uh, taking out his frustrations on the streets as opposed to mm -hmm. praying in church. And I and I and I thought, wow, that's so how profound to be able to <laughs> to take. So I, so in a way, you know. In a way, it, it's always been there. By true, I agree with you that those three films are probably his most personal films because I think if a film could be a self-portrait, I think he would agree that those three films are probably pretty accurate self-portraits of who he is as a person. Mm -hmm. No, I would definitely agree with that, and I I have heard that about uh I have heard that uh, about a uh, taxi driver and his use of the overhead shots. Uh, mean Streets, right. I had completely forgotten he had done the uh, opening narration. It's been years since I've seen that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I so I definitely need to get reacquainted with that one at some point. Um, yeah, it's and it's 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 one of the things, and I just love to a certain extent. I know all three of these to for one reason or another were very difficult for him to make. It's like last temptation. A big part of it was the controversy that was that arose based on the novel and people's perception of the novel and what it was saying. And the fact that yeah, and the, all the controversy and the fact that he basically ended up with working with half the budget that he was originally promised. Kundun, right. you had, um, you had resistance from the Chinese, which is a big part of the reason why that movie is not available. Um, and right. the fact that Disney is basically self-suppressed it, sort of in a way like they have Song with Song of the South, but in, for very different reasons. And then Silence, of course, has been 25 years in the making. And, uh, yes. you know, I, I think for it, it wouldn't be that much of a stretch to really i mean obviously he he was absolutely determined to make all of these movies count if only because based on just the struggles that he had in making them and uh right. it's definitely it it's definitely something that um it it's definitely one of the things that i'm i'm most fascinated about with these movies and it's like i think it it's fast it's interesting to watch uh different films about faith and just sort of or religious films or however you want it. faith based films yeah. if you want to look at them and just see 
you know, you wish that more faith-based films had the same artistic uh, integrity that these three do. Because it's like, I yeah. think to a certain extent, uh, I think to a certain extent they might actually, you know, be able to get their message across a lot better and really truly resonate with people on a much deeper level than they kind of do. And, uh, yes. you know, it's, and so that's, so when you, I mean, these are obviously head, head above, head and shoulders above, uh, those, most of those films, certainly, um, that we see in theaters. But, uh, and I, I think one of the things that I've really, especially with Last Temptation, which is by, which is my favorite of the three, but I mean, I, I, I think it's hard for me now to, having seen all three of them back to back to back, it's impossible for me to not see them as part of a series and just sort of yeah. have them as equals. Uh, one of the things I've always really liked about Last Temptation, one of the things I've always really admired about Last Temptation is it's more so than a lot of those faith-based films that come out, it's really even as somebody who's not, you know, specifically religious like me, it's it's really given me a lot to think about when it comes to religion, when it comes to faith, when it comes to personal faith. And yes. it's it's probably the most identifiable I've ever, you know, I've ever it's it's the most identifiable Jesus I think I've ever ha had, you know, in terms of a story being told and the fact that it's like you see the fact that his divinity was not a given right away, or at least his interpretation of his divinity was not a given right away. It was something he worked at, it was something he struggled with. And it's like yeah. that, and being able to, it's something that's very, uh, that really has resonated with me, really I found identifiable with him more than even the bl biblical um story of jesus absolutely yeah um what i yeah and you make a good point about that how it's identifiable i think part of the reason why that film is so identifiable for me is the way the dialogue is written the, the dialogue is written in such a way where it doesn't feel like it's trying to talk above the audience but rather talking with them like uh and, and, uh like the scorsese often describe it as Street talk, uh, mm -hmm. street corner talk, but where he wanted he wanted the audience to feel like that that they were watching a conversation on a street corner rather than rather than trying to watch a film where the language was so dated that you couldn't understand what what they were saying. I thought that was a very smart decision because by doing that, he's able to get the audience to identify with that. He, he used a similar technique later on with uh, Wolf of Wall Street, even and also in Silence. But in Wolf of Wall Street, whenever whenever Leonardo DiCaprio's character is talking about something Wall Street related that's so that so uh, that, that that you just can't understand because of the terminology. Mm -hmm. He literally says to the camera, "Hold on, let's stop for a second. You don't know what you don't know what I'm saying." And so I thought that was I thought that was great as well. So I I thought that was it made the film more approachable because, as you said, when it comes to films about faith and religion, that's a you know that's a very tricky line to cross where. The, the film could either end up being very heavy-handed, where it's uh, beating you over the head with a message about fate, and or it could be just too repetitive. And here, he does it in a way where it doesn't feel that way. It feels authentic. It feels real. Mm -hmm. uh, if that sort of makes sense. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. I I absolutely agree with that. And uh, yeah, because I mean, I I think especially a lot of evangelical. Uh, films i mean for them the message is what counts and that's what they're trying to yeah. do and it's like they're not they're thinking about it as a film separately they're thinking more about the message and so when they're writing it that's what and so they're basically the problem with that though is that they're going to end up preaching to choir and it's like yes. and and the fact that and it's it the the fact that you mentioned that it's like yeah he he's basically looking at last temptation and he's basically looking at the story and he's he's treating it as he he's treating it as a, as street talk is just 
regular conversation about this this subject and it's like and I think that's one of the things where it really helps have Willem Dafoe and Harvey Keitel in their characters and it's like in their respective characters is Jesus and Judas and it's like no they're obviously not the first people you would think of to cast in those roles if you were doing yeah. like a big Cecil B. DeMille period piece of it but at the same time exactly. if you're doing a Scorsese yep. story of faith that's basically supposed to be that's supposed to be uh identifiable and recognizable and accessible i mean that that actually makes sense to have that to have those mm-hmm. actors there because of the fact that it's like though those you you don't feel like you don't feel like you're being talked down to or you don't right. feel like you be you're being preached to. You feel like you're just watching this story unfold in yep. a very naturalistic manner. Right. And 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 the element of Barbara Hershey's performance in that film is amazing. Mm-hmm. She is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, and it's you know, and it's funny, it's like the more you think the more I watch that movie, the more I I can't help but think just how ridiculously overblown the controversy about was because it's like yeah. basically the controversy was boiled, was boiled down to there's a sex scene between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. It it yes. A it's only a couple minutes long. B if it weren't for the nudity, it would be perfectly acceptable as a PG thirteen love scene. Yes. And C if you're just focusing on that, you're missing the entire point of what that last temptation Absolutely. is. The last yeah. temptation is simply to live a human life, to renounce his his destiny that his father is putting in front of him, and to simply live a human life. That's it. That, exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's it. And, and and at the same time, it also he's uh, he's also he's also. Um, I, I mean, for example, the scene where he's in the circle and the snake approaches him, the lion approaches him, mm-hmm. uh, all the temptations come to him and testing him, that says a lot about the human, about us as human beings as well, because we're also, uh, temptations always draw on us in some way or another, and mm-hmm. it's uh, always testing us to see, are we going to follow or are we going to hold back? And uh, just that moment with the snake, um, trying to tease him. I was, I, I like that moment quite a bit. The, the use of the voiceover and yeah. just uh, William, yeah, Defoe's performance in that particular scene. That that's the message of the film right there. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And I mean, going through and the and it's funny because of the fact that it's like also the more I and I I try to watch Last Temptation at least once a year because it is one of my favorite yes. movies of all time. The the key moment in the the actual temptation se- last temptation sequence is where he meets Harry Dean Stanton's character, and yep. Harry Dean Stanton's character is you know telling about his uh, transformation from Saul to Paul, and he's and when Jesus uh, confronts him about it, and it's the first indication that you really. For me, to a certain extent, that you get that it's like something's not right here, and you sort of get the impression that Jesus is kind of figuring. To a certain extent, he's still he's still too proud to realize what exactly is going on. But at the same time, you kind of get the feeling that it's like, wait a minute, there's something not quite right here. Why are you saying yes. these things about me when they aren't true? Right. I mean, that's the key moment in that. And before we get to the very end of the temptation where he's on his deathbed and then uh, Satan reveals himself and he finally uh, he he finally accepts his uh, responsibility on the cross, that is the key scene in that temptation where it's like, wait a minute. And the, the angel was saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it's the 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 way the storytelling and going back and like you said going back to the scene in the desert is it's it's definitely an important part of that uh because of the fact that it's setting up that end of the movie 
Yeah. Yeah. And uh, absolutely. Yeah. And and you know there are a couple of other you know there's a lot of other things that are really fantastic about the movies. All three movies are just spectacularly beautiful to watch. I oh, mean, yeah. I, Kundun is oh, probably. Yeah. I mean, Kundun is probably Roger Deakins, some of Roger Deakins' best work as a cinematographer, if not his best. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And the fact that he yeah, didn't win an Oscar for that is just shameful. Uh, oh, yeah. No. But, and, uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah, Silence and Michael Balhaus just did a fen- phenomenal job with Last Temptation. And just the way yeah. that... They they brought a lot of the same aesthetic that they bring to uh, something like Goodfellas into, you know, first a movie set in first century Judea is just it it gives it an energy that it nobody else could really give it. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and you know, for, I mean, we unfortunately recently lost uh, Michael Ballhouse. Yeah, uh, he was you know, a wonderful cinematographer and. Uh, that movie is, I mean, Last Temptation is one of the best looking pictures I've ever seen. I, it's just, uh, but I agree. There, there is a certain energy to the camera work uh, that is evident in how it's shot, like with the whip pans and some of the, uh, some, some, uh, some of the cutting and the editing uh, mm-hmm. that is kind, kind of evident as well when they later worked on Goodfellas together and, I noticed too, like uh, in that in that era in the '80s, is when Scorsese kind of started getting that more energetic shooting and style. Whereas in the '70s, he seemed to have more of a style that was uh, a little more cinema verite. If I if mm-hmm. I, I I must say, uh, especially um, you watch Me Streets, you watch Taxi Driver, it feels um, Almost similar verite in the sense that we're almost like a voyeur in the situation, and then uh, come around to films like After Hours or Color of Money. You know the the energy really amped up, and 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 like you said, even though that the uh, the film takes place, you know, in, in Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem, correct, or is it uh, someplace else? I don't recall. Um, but uh, but yeah, even even though it takes place in uh, in another time, there is something energetic about the camera work still. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely, and yeah, it, it's and it is interesting that it's like yeah, you I I never really thought about the difference of uh, style Scorsese had in the seventies compared to how he did in the eighties, and actually the movies you listed after Hours and Color Money, in addition to. Last Temptation, those were all the first times he had worked with Balhas. And so yeah. it's like when it was when he started working with him is really when that shift happened. And then they get, did Goodfellas. I think they did Age of Innocence together, too. Um, they did, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it, yeah, that that shift does change. And so and so when he he changed it to a more it was a more deliberate pace in uh Kundun with Roger Deakins, although, I mean, there are still moments of that energetic, uh, you know, you know, just sort of a smash cut type uh, shooting in there. It's also very deliberately paced when compared to uh, Last Temptation, because the thing about Last Temptation is it moves really fast and it's really surprising. for a two hour and 40 minute movie, I felt like I, I, when it was finished, I was like, Oh wow. That was a very yeah. quick film. I, I, I was amazed how quick it was. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely, and, and you, you move to Kundun and then you move to silence and, uh, Rodrigo, uh, Pietro did just stunning work as cinematographer on there. And, and that yeah. movie, there's just some amazing shots in that film. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Especially the very last shot of the film. That that was yeah. one that when I saw that, I mean, I'm, I'm sure some CGI elements are probably built into that last shot, but something about it was very, very powerful. Oh yeah. Um, I just well, the whole film was powerful. I mean, the the film took me back to not only the last temptation, but even some of the more grand, uh, grander epic films of the '60s, like some of the more uh, like, like for example. Um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, or like uh, you know things like that, or even 
Michael Cimino 78. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of grand epic um, kind of look, which I absolutely adore. I mean, just yeah. the, every, every shot was like a gorgeous painting. Mm-hmm. No, and it, it's funny because of the fact that it's like, I think I'd forgotten it because it had been, I just watched Silence again this morning uh, in preparation for this because it, I hadn't seen it since uh, January. And I had actually forgotten, or may, I think maybe I, although I think I did forget it, that like that like you were talking about, that last shot is just really beautiful. And yeah, there's no doubt there's some, cgi in there but at the same time it it's like it's so so subtle you just can't you 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 yeah. don't think about it. but i i couldn't help but think of that last shot as sort of uh a nod to citizen kane and the very end of citizen kane where it's like you you, oh, you come yes. you come in to the shot of the sled and realize what rosebud is same similarly yes. you have the last shot of silence where you see him holding that uh, cross and you sort of your mind gets racing and you you realize that in fact he he sort of took um one of his uh, jailer's words to heart when he's when the jailer is basically telling him is that it's it's just a gesture what you're doing is just a gesture when talking yes. about the uh apostatizing and stepping right. on the yeah, and, uh yeah no that that was wonderful and how and and how yeah like how uh, and how it was it was just, it was a way of saying he never truly lost his faith he was doing yeah. it to keep him to keep himself alive and to keep and to uh follow his master's doing mm-hmm. which i thought was so it was so poignant and so wonderful yeah no, absolutely, and I mean that was that was one of the that was one of the more fascinating things because of the fact that it's like you watch a lot of the end of that, and you you feel to a certain extent you still you see that he never really loses his face, but you're not quite sure just because of the yep. fact that they end up they're they're basically working for the Japanese government as far as like. You know, yes. pointing out Christian artifacts and non-Christian compared to non-Christian artifacts, and uh, just you know, basically, uh, and basically working for the Japanese. But then you have the other key character in that movie, which is Kachiro, who has basically been, who really has been the test for uh, Rodriguez throughout the entire movie. In terms right. of how he, and it's the real test to see how he, how Rodriguez is as a spiritual leader and how he reacts to K- Kichiro. This person who basically yes. is, who who has betrayed him time and time again and has basically come out on the other side. And yet Rodriguez still feels the the burden of feeling like he needs to uh, forgive him and allow him absolution. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I should, we should also mention too, um, Adam driver, who, yeah. you know, whose role is, you know, is brief in it, but, uh, uh, but he's, but he, he adds a certain element to it that I really enjoyed, especially, uh, uh, without giving too much away, of course, um, the scene where Garfield is um, is stuck watching Adam Driver fall into the water. Yeah, that that is uh, that that was one moment that um, had me at the edge of my seat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and and that was that that is definitely one of the more powerful mo- moments in the movie. Just basically any of the moments you see you see in the movie where uh, the the Padres are just feel complete or completely hope, helpless in trying to save and, and trying to save any, any of these people from dying. And that's definitely one of the more powerful ones where it's like, he's, yeah. he's seeing these farmers basic, he's seeing these farmers drown. They seeing uh, M driver's character, uh, going to the water, and he he just he's he's somebody who cannot he he's like uh, 
Rodriguez at that point in the movie where it's like he just cannot renounce his faith. And yeah. he his faith leads him to sacrifice himself. And so and and so Rodriguez character he doesn't get there until later after his moment obviously with uh Liam Neeson at the end which is which is just a phenomenal scene and it's like it's it's amazing it's almost surprising given how much he's been known for like action movies mindless action movies and stuff and it's a real tribute to Liam Neeson that it's like he can still uh command a significant presence in a movie even in just a couple of scenes yeah no it's uh it's a it's a really it's a really reserved and quiet performance in, in the best way uh there's a lot there's a lot there's a lot that he shows uh in that role mm-hmm. yeah and you know it, it it's one of those things where it's like you it's funny because of the fact that you you've got Andrew Garfield who is Spider-Man but you also have M Drivers Kylo Ren and the new Star Wars movies and Liam Neeson right. who is Qui-Gon Jinn it's like you always watch Liam Neeson's performance and you think why can why could the prequels have like this type of performance from him as Qui Gon, yeah. as opposed to what we ended up getting in Fan Menace, but uh, exactly. But uh, yeah, so it's that that's just one of those fun little geeky things that you you kind of go on, you know, comes into your head and then just leaves immediately afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Um, yep. But uh, you know, and one of the things that one of the things that I pointed out uh, earlier was how I is when we were talking about Last Temptation of Kundun specifically, just uh, and you know we did bring it up with silence the idea of uh, basically ultimately all three of these films are about uh, religious leaders who have and the journey they go on to be the best possible. Uh, teachers of their faith and practitioners yeah. of their faith to others that they can be. And so like Jesus's story is well known, even despite the, uh, despite the ways it is uh, adapted in last temptation, it fundamentally stays true to the story of the Bible um, yes. in terms of the streamlined narrative. Kundun, you have a uh, child who was chosen to be the spiritual and political leader, and you see his struggle to how to do that in turbulent times. And then you see the the characters played by a Andrew Garfield and M. Driver struggling with that as well in silence. And you, in particular, M. Dr Andrew Garfield's character, because he's basically... He's basically the central character of the film, and yeah. just seeing what is what, and seeing him have to figure out what his responsibility is to the people who have pronounced their love of Jesus and the God that uh, he is preaching about, and how does that? How can he? How can he be the best person for that? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, yeah, totally. And I like, uh, I, I feel the same way. And I also, you know, again, uh, I mean, with silence, with silence, well, silence in particular, uh, I think, I think, I mean, again, I haven't seen Kundun, uh, quite yet, but, uh, of the, but I think the silence and last temptation for me, especially I haven't watched last temptation again for the first time in a while, a few years ago, I was watching and I'm thinking, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize how similar, even in story structure, each film is, um, very similar beats and very similar, um, get very similar structure overall. And, and the, uh, one thing that struck me was how much, uh, Andrew Garfield's character is much like, the character of Jesus and last temptation. He, you know, they both have to, again, as you mentioned, to share their faith in a, in a world where people are denouncing it. And I think it's relevant to 
I, you, you, you can argue it's even relevant to us um, as people, you know, and, uh, and people, you know, who debate over, you know, religion and who agrees with what and, and uh, what religion they follow, which one is correct. And that's kind of what I got, what I got of the two films was, was that, was uh, that sense of reality that he brings to them. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely, and uh, yeah, and that in and you know when I when I realized that that was a very common thread within the three films, it's like wow, I and because of the fact that all three films are structural in in terms of the subject matter, in terms of the the base subject matter, the base narratives are very different. There's the fact that there's all of these remarkable similarities in terms of the type of story they're telling and what and what they're uh and how they're presenting their subject um as a whole is is it's it's really a tribute to just how uh creative a filmmaker like Scorsese is the fact that he's and it, it's true of any type of films that he's made, whether you're talking about Departed, Goodfellas, Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, Mean Streets. Just whenever he does something uh, similar in in form in narrative that he's done before, just the little the the little ways he twists it in order to make it something very new. But at the same time, you can you can point a you can go from point A to point B to point C and just sort of see the similarities along the way. And yep. just the way those two work is very, uh, makes, makes those films all the more special. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because, um, when the, when the, when the non movie buff talks about Scorsese, uh, it's always, uh, they, he's always described as, the gangster filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And I always have to say, I always have to say to people, nope, he is not, nope, he's not a gangster filmmaker. Uh, <laughs> I always tell them, you know, but I always tell them, nope, so that means you've only seen Goodfellas and Casino and possibly, possibly The Departed. I said, you have to watch his other films because each one has something totally different. There are similarities, mm-hmm. certainly, but uh, there's always something different that he's saying um, be it cinematically or thematically, yeah. uh, you know, Wolf Wall Street structurally is just like Goodfellas, mm. but they can't be any more different from each other. Yeah. No, ab- absolutely, and it's like that's, and even even when you're looking at uh, even when you bring in something that's very out of left field, like Hugo, it's like you can point to you can see similarities. With Hugo, with some of these different films, I mean, there, I, there's, a, and it's a spiritual connection. It's not necessarily a narrative connection or a structural connection, but it's, it's, it's something within the the film and the way he tells the story that just puts it in line with uh, other films that he's made in the past. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hugo is one I adored. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but 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 no, I mean, uh, but, and, and that film was, like you said, very different for him. Uh, but there is certainly there are certainly similarities um, to his to the previous works, visually especially. A lot of the long takes and a lot mm-hmm. of the uh, uh, and and the and the protagonist who is, I suppose, a. I suppose a a, a a a lost soul. I suppose looking in from the outside, yeah. who has to who has to spread a message of some sort, and not even a message, but mm-hmm. in this case, he's he's kind of he's kind of tracing this uh, this uh, toy maker, you know, and then what he comes to discover is that he's tracing the pure, the uh, the start of cinema, and uh, you know, I, you know, in that way. And that way, again, you know, going back to the idea that Scorsese believes that going to a similar, similar to going to pass, you can say it's kind of like the same, um, 
plight that Jesus has in Last Temptation, or that mm-hmm. Rodriguez has in Silence and Doom and so forth. Oh, no, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, the, the one that I was more, re- more thinking about in that terms of comparison to those three movies was Kundun because of the fact that uh, the Dalai Lama starts out as a child. But no, I mean, yes. it, you can definitely make a uh, you can definitely make a uh, comparison to the other two movies there as well. Um, although I don't know, I don't know if it's quite as obvious. Certainly, because of the fact no. that they're very different films. Um, sure. But at the same time, no, you're absolutely no, you're you're definitely you're absolutely right there, and that's that's one of the. That's one of the things that great filmmakers are able to do. They're able to uh, find common links from. They're able to uh, tell stories with common links uh, from film to film. That uh, we, you know, it if we're astute enough in the in following the filmmaker, we're able to see those. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's kind of why I admire about about him is the fact that he's able to uh, say so much mm-hmm. and yet and yet say and yet say the same and yet say a similar message but in different genres and uh, that's one thing many people don't realize about him is how diverse a filmmaker he is. I mean from yeah. having done uh, dramas to crime uh, crime dramas, comedies, uh, uh, horror, even at one point or another, or rather psychological thriller. Yeah, uh, a couple times, and, and you know, family film, you know, Hugo, and so forth. And so it's uh, he, he really he's one of the more diverse filmmakers in the past forty years, I would say. I mean, because most uh, directors that we that we see, they tend to stick to the same drama uh, to the same uh, 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 genre. Uh, Kubrick was another one that was very diverse in his filmmaking, having done so many different types of genres, but mm-hmm. yet, but yet had, but but yet his messages and a lot of what he said. You watch a Kubrick movie, you know right away it's a Kubrick movie. You watch a Scorsese movie, same thing. He has that signature style. Mm-hmm. No, it's absolutely true. Um, I mean, it's 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 definitely one of the things that. Uh, it's one of the things I greatly admire about uh, Scorsese. That and just the wealth of sim knowledge that he 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 shows. I mean, his documentaries on American and Italian films yes. are just as indispensable as any of his narrative films are. And it's like, and you you really get a clear idea of who he is as an individual and what's important to him. You know, once mm-hmm. you once you really boil it down to what are these stories about, how are the and how are these stories about it? And it's like it's not just about, you know, violence and how many F bombs they can put into a movie like Wolf of Wall Street or Goodfellas. It's about something truly spiritual about the human condition that he's trying to uh he he's trying to uh, bring out and I mean obviously these films are very much and probably the best examples of uh, that that he's done although I mean you can easily make that case for uh, Taxi Driver or Raging Bull as well yes yeah absolutely and uh, you make a good point about uh, his knowledge of cinema One of, and that's one thing I'm attracted to as well is how when I first the first time I ever heard an interview from him uh talking about filmmaking, his passion for cinema, clear passion for cinema, just seeps off the screen or mm-hmm. off the page if you're reading about him. I uh, just It's so evident how much he loves what he does. Uh, and uh, for him, uh, you know, I think he... I, I can't remember if he's the one who said this or somebody else had said it, but uh, uh, it's, it's evident... Like, basically, it's evident that for him... The, the screen is his canvas and the camera is his paintbrush. And he's one of the few that is truly an artist in that, in that sense of the word, as mm-hmm. most directors, most directors in, in Hollywood, at least, um, you know, it's, it's more or less a paycheck for them. It's sad to say. Yeah. No, that's, no, that's definitely true. And I mean, I'm, I'm fairly certain I've heard that said about him as well. If, if not that being a quote from him, I mean, it's certainly, it's, obviously true i mean after 40 
actually going on 50 years because I think his first features were in the 60s. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he's definitely he, he's definitely somebody who is uh, carved, carved out one of the more unique niches in uh, movie history. I mean, it's not just because... And, I mean, obviously other people did crime films before him, other people have done crime films after him, but the fact of the matter is you really have to get into his films and you really have to get into something like The Last Temptation of Christ or Kundun or A mm -hmm. Silence to really appreciate how good he is and how much uh, imagination and how much uh, storytelling passion he has in order to yeah. uh, get to that. I'm not sure if I have yeah. too much more on on the matter. I mean, I could probably talk about, uh, we could probably go point by point about a lot of Scorsese films and go for a few more hours, but... Uh, I definitely did want. I did, definitely did want to talk about uh, these three these three films as well, mainly because of the common elements they have in terms of the stories they tell, and uh, also the way they tell them. And uh, you know, hopefully, you know, hopefully, silence. And I think it will. I mean, it, even if it's you know not for another several years, like it was with Last Temptation, hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully, silence, and then you know if it's ever uh, rediscovered, uh, Kundun will you know take their place sort of along the lines of Last Temptation as uh, some of the most some of the best, but also some of the most important films uh, not only Scorsese has ever made, but have just been made. Period. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I would love to see. Uh, I would love to see a distributor just take all three and put them in a back-to-back -back screening of some kind, or, or oh, yeah. Criterion release, or, <laughs> or have Criterion uh, release uh, both Silence and Kundun because Last Temptation has a release from Criterion. Yes, um, but those two deserve a release for sure. Mm -hmm. No, I I agree, and that's something that I've been kind of hoping for with. Uh... Silence coming out is that well maybe Criterion will finally get Disney to allow them to release Kundun and uh, mm -hmm. we'll be able to get that box set sort of like they've done for uh, Bergman's trilogy of uh, yep. Through Glass Darkly, uh, The Silence, and Winter Light. Yeah, it's funny because Scorsese, that's his only film on Criterion is uh, Last Impatient. Rest of his films, no release, which often surprises me. Yeah. Yeah, the the fact that the fact that there are certain movie I mean it's not just Scorsese. I mean there are other films that oh, no. uh, that yeah. it's like how is Criterion not got that? And, I mean, I think Bring yeah. Out the Dead is another one that I would really like to see Criterion bring out. Uh yeah. and really sort of, cuz it was funny watching that a couple of years ago. I I wasn't a huge fan of it when I first saw it, but it was a very different mm -hmm. uh film watcher when I first watched it, I hadn't really dived into Scorsese's films just yet. So now after all of these years, I watched bring out the dead again. And it's like, it had a very different impact and it was, it was a very different film for me too. So, yeah. um, you know, hopefully, hopefully that would definitely, I would definitely like to see that happen though. in the next couple oh, of years, because I, I mean, I would definitely like to hear uh, Marty Marty's thoughts on both comment doing commentary on both uh, Kundun and Silence. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I you know because is the the commentary they put together for Last Temptation is just really entertaining, and the the de the Criterion release is just phenomenal for that one. Uh, yeah, I'm so glad they were able to get that together. Oh, me too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think we're going to wrap it up right now. But uh, okay. thank, I'm I'm glad we were able to do this. This is something, like I said, I've wanted to do for a few months, and um, glad we were able to do this because I really and I really enjoy uh, going on back and forth online with you on film, and uh, we we seem to have a lot of common interests as far as uh, cinema, as far as the filmmakers we we enjoy mm -hmm. so uh this was definitely something that i wanted to do 
So yeah, we'll I, have to take on we'll have to take on Andre Tarzowski next. I know you're a fan of him as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, I'm, I, it's funny. I, it, it's it's funny. I just I saw an announcement yesterday that uh, uh, well, several announcements actually. Well, for one thing, Stalker is coming to Criterion yes. next month, I believe, which is really exciting. And then in the UK, it's a Region Two set, unfortunately, but they have all his films in one box set yes. for ninety nine ninety nine. And like, and <laughs> I wish I had a, I wish I had a Region Three player because I would buy that because it's just, it's jam packed with uh, extra material, notes mm-hmm. from him because he was another filmmaker I, I truly admire. Yeah. No, and I, I cannot wait for Stalker to finally come out in Criterion. I'm still waiting on them to uh, re-release Andre Rublev because yeah. I, I have the same in, issue with that that I do with uh, Kundu, and I've got a non-anamorphic uh, widescreen release, oh, and right. it just doesn't look good on the TV that I've got. I mean, it's still, it's still a beautiful movie, but it, it there's so little it on the screen. It's ridiculous. Sure. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, we'll, we, we can definitely talk about that because about Tarkovsky because of the fact that, yeah, I, I, he, he's a filmmaker. It means a lot to me as a, as, as a creative person, as a fan of, uh, cinema. He's definitely, uh, influenced me, uh, a lot over the years, but yeah, we'll mm-hmm. definitely have to do that. Um, Excellent. but yeah, thank you very much for, uh, joining me today. And uh, no, it was thank you. it was really thank great to there, yeah. it was really great to talk to you about this and really uh, really have a nice conversation about these uh, movies. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much again for thinking of me. Oh no problem, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, Chris Esper for joining me today. Thank you to uh, Chris Esper for joining me last night. It was a lot of fun talking to him about these uh, three exceptional films and uh, meaningful films for both of us. And uh, hopefully we'll do it again. Uh, As you heard, we were talking about uh, possibly doing it for Andrei Tarkovsky, which is is one of my favorite filmmakers, and we will probably get to that at some point in the next few months. But uh, for now, thank you for joining us at www.sonic-cinema.com. Until next time.